So once again, I'm going to break from my 250 year old persona and uh, fast forward to today. And uh, we are in beautiful Algonquin Park and you can see the kaleidoscope of colors behind me. First week of October, uh, here for a number of reasons. One is to take in the beauty and the colors, uh, but more importantly, I'm gonna be practicing on the new uh, moose call that I made. Uh, moose hunting is, uh, two weeks away. Yeah, two weeks. We're going to be about 200 miles in that direction, uh, hunting moose in northern Quebec. And while I'm on northern Quebec, uh, my wife, when she was 15, had already been on her first canoe trip and developed this lifelong passion that she has for it. And her father was building uh, roads in a new national park they were building up there. And so she went along with him, tagged along, and she met this uh, Cree elder that was building a canoe exactly like the one I'm paddling today. Uh, she fell in love with it, asked him if she could buy it. He said, no, this one's sold. And he said, in fact, I'm retiring. This is, this is going to be my last canoe. He was, he was quite old. Uh, I don't know, Kathy must have smiled nicely. Uh, he agreed to build one more. Uh, her and her older sister, Lisa, uh, went home and started babysitting like crazy and they saved all their money from babysitting and they went uh, halves on this beautiful canoe. So this canoe is, uh, this is going <laughs> to really date Kathy, but this canoe is 50 years old this year. And of all the canoes we own, of all the different materials, including birch bark, this one paddles better than any. It's just the sweetest canoe on the water. Uh, Anyway, I'm gonna tuck back in here. There's a beautiful wetland in behind us here. I'm gonna see if I can still talk moose. I have called the darn things in very close to me, uh, but it's been a while since I practiced, and uh, <laughs> trust me, it's a lot better practicing out here in the open than it is in my house or my cabin. So we're gonna see if we can uh, find a good spot, set up with the wind in our favor. I'm gonna do some calling, and then I think I'll just lean back against a tree, read a book for the rest of the day, in fact, I'm reading a gray owl book. How, how appropriate. And we'll see if we can bring a moose in. So even if one doesn't get a moose, one doesn't have to starve. Uh, we're looking at a plant called arrow, arrowroot, and uh, it's an edible plant. You can dig up the roots, you can cook them up, and uh, yeah, I, I've tried it, and I gotta admit, it's the worst thing that ever passed my lips, but if, if one needed to sustain themselves, there is food in the wild. This is uh, one of literally thousands of interior campsites in Algonquin. It is a massive park. Uh, canoed a whole lot here in the early 70s as a teenager. Uh, there were a lot less people then, uh, but they've done a great job of allowing a lot more people to experience the beautiful topography and wildlife of this area. On this topic of wildlife, moose will typically pick, I'm on an island here, will typically pick an island to give birth. Uh, gives them some protection against wolves and bears. Most large animals like us aren't going to expend energy. They don't have to. Uh, the mortality of moose calves is approximately 50% in the first year. So this helps uh, reduce that mortality rate by giving birth on islands. Often you'll see them where there's a spattering of islands between the mainland and they'll just jump from island to island if they're in danger. Anyway, off to explore more beautiful parts of this park. We're hearing loons in the backdrop here, an iconic symbol of this park. The beauty of this area uh, attracted the group of seven, the famous group of seven Canadian artists in the uh, late 18, early 1900s. And Tom Thompson, uh, on July 8th, 1970, uh, his body was found in Canoe Lake. Um, 
they found his body on that day. They didn't find his upturned, or they found his upturned canoe on that date, found his body eight days later. And, and it remains a mystery to this day as to why there was speculation whether he was murdered or whether it was suicide. There is no col conclusive evidence of, of either, but um, I guess we'll, we'll never know. And uh, Canoe Lake, there's a cairn marking, um, marking his, uh, his death. This is an absolutely outstanding day in the park. Um, before I get into the establishment of Algonquin Park proper, the real history begins with the Algonquin First Nations people who inhabited this area 8,000 years before Europeans, which is in the 1500s. So they were here for a long time. They were hunter-gatherers, unlike their uh, other nations to the south, like the Huron and the Iroquois, who were agrarian, um, small organized groups of hunter-gatherers, which attracted the French because they were good at trapping animals in, in, the, in, in the fur trade. They were also known as some of the best birch bark canoe builders, and, and uh, Kathy and I build birch bark canoes, and a question we often get is, how old is it? How long has the canoe been around? We know, uh, go back to archaeology again, we know that they, we see tools about 3,500 years years ago um, that indicate that they're in a transition from tools designed for digging out dugout canoes to tools specifically designed for birch bark canoes, like the splitting mall for cedar, like the mogatagan, which Europeans called the crooked or crooked knife. Uh, anyway, a fascinating history that's a lot older than the park itself. I'm going to go for another little paddle because this is, uh, the water is like a mill pond here today. It's just absolutely perfect. If you think about, uh, while I'm on the subject to canoes, we think about some of the things that natives gifted us. Uh, the canoe, the toboggan, the snowshoe, and uh, we absolutely use different materials, but for the most part, they've remained unchanged for, for in the canoe's case, 3,500 years. And uh, yeah, they were fabulous gifts that we've utilized for hundreds and hundreds of years. This park was established in 1893. Uh, it was, it's uh, Ontario's oldest provincial park. It, uh, in terms of size, it's huge. It has, it's 7,000 square kilometers or 3,600 square miles. There's over 2,400 lakes, like the one I'm paddling in right now, and over 1,200 kilometers of river. A lot of the, uh, the history of this park was the logging industry. Uh, in the late 18th, uh, or sorry, er, late 18th and early 19th century, um, this was old growth forest and it was logged for the first time ever. A lot of it was for American markets and a lot of it was to make square timbers that made their way to, um, to England. This is what I would call a blueberry patch. There is literally a few hundred acres on this sand plateau and uh, one wouldn't have to work very hard to get a six quart basket. Fortunately, uh, berries are gone and there's no bears about, but I'm sure one would find a lot of bears in this area at the right time of the year. The dinner bell. We're gonna have a look inside a late 1800s, early 1900s cook shed. And, uh, <laughs> I can totally relate to this because my grandpa Hannon, who immigrated here from Ireland in the late 1800s, actually went north and cooked for the logging camps in the winter and the railroad camps in the summer. And <laughs> boy, that fella could tell some stories. <laughs> <laughs>